thank you. This is um, the uh, board uh, education um, work session on FMP. Uh, let me just say good, after, good evening. Um, we are calling this work session together so that the board gets a, um, a um, introduction to the schools, um, to the programs that we're going to be renovating for phase three. Phase three is a, a $450 million project. And this is an opportunity for the Board of Education uh, to review and to provide its input into this process. Uh, this is the first opportunity that we will have to do this um, throughout the project. Uh, the board will um, participate in other uh, meetings around FMP. Um, also, the community will get an opportunity to also to provide input into this process. Uh, Mike Smith, who is the uh, Chief Operations Officer, uh, will be, be providing us with an overview of what it is, um, what the um, next phase in the schools that's contained in there uh, will be. And um, I will turn it over to Mike at this point. Mike? Thank you so much, President Elliott. Good evening, uh, Vice President LeBron, Commissioners. The uh, I think what we uh, Carmine and I have worked together with uh, on this uh, on this opening uh, work session, first of uh, first of numerous ones. That's what I'll, we'll talk about a little bit a little bit further in our in our in our conversation this evening. But I first want to take the uh, take the pleasure of introducing Erica Abandizari. Erica is the uh, lead architect who is working with us on developing a lot of the technical uh, sides of our strategic plan. Uh, she works for Watts, uh, Watts architectural engineering firm out of, uh, out of Buffalo. So um, she's, she's with us tonight to provide us some technical assistance. If we, uh, if Carmine need it, probably more of a lifeguard than she has anything else tonight. Um, but I, I think uh, as we're, we're going to do our goal tonight really is to provide you as much information as we have to date and, uh, and walk you through, walk you through next steps as you're, as you're going to, uh, see them. So I'm going to turn over to my good friend, uh, Deputy Superintendent, uh, Dr. Peluso. Thank you, Mike. So once again, thank you, President Elliott, Vice President LeBron, Commissioners, and all our staff, families, and community members joining us tonight on Facebook or YouTube. So this evening, like um, Chief Operating Officer Schmidt was saying, we'd like to continue to provide updates, have some discussions, receive your input, and make some decisions regarding phase three and the strategic plan. Um, what we need to accomplish this evening is to make sure that the board and the community has um, an introduction to phase three strategic plan, like um, President Elliott had referenced, that we're gonna confirm that board policy 4100, which is also known as organization in of instruction, which also organizes our school in a K-5, 6, 8, and 9, 12 structure is the direction we will be moving forward in. That you know the information, the criteria, and data you will receive throughout this process to assist with decision making, and that's including the alignment to the academic and fiscal plan, um, building condition surveys, enrollment trends, the test fit uh, suitability, and then cost alignment with state ed, and then understand the role the board have had in the process, the opportunities that we'll have to provide input um, throughout this process and the opportunities for the community to provide input throughout this process. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to our Chief Operating Officer, Mike Schmidt, who is gonna take us through the rest of the presentation. Thank you. You're muted, uh, Mike. My apologies, I'm muted. My apologies. I'll go back to the beginning. Uh, uh, first and foremost, I want to take the time to, to uh, at least outline this is our initial team. Uh, there will be many more, many more internal and external stakeholders that will be part of this. But this is as of uh, who have been participating in our work in our work plan uh, up to uh, up to today, July 25th. Um, the uh, so as I said, we got a, a pretty broad range of our cabinet members as well as some key personnel in uh, on my team to get uh, to get us off and running. Uh, and then, as we said, there's there's uh, four members of our consultant team, 
Watts Architects and Engineers, SWBR, McGibbons Demographics, and Trophy Point Construction Cost Analysis. It's important to note that the consultant team is contracted with the Joint School Construction Board. They are not contracted with the school district. They are here to provide us this service, but I wanna make sure that I make that differentiation, which ties back into the meeting we had um, prior to the finance committee meeting prior to the June resolution that uh, provided a, a shift of funds to the facility, uh, the Joint School Construction Board to get this process uh, process started. So after the after phase three legislation was passed, the uh, the, the district has, has begun work, and there is a as I as I kind of outlined earlier in our June presentation, this looks uh, significantly different than than what we've done prior to phase one and phase two. And the primary difference is that the, uh, the state education department has tasked the district with developing a strategic plan for the phase three work. Now in phase one and phase two, we certainly had recently did that in direct alignment with the um, projects that we were gonna be uh, completing. The difference here is the state has also asked us to make some larger decisions around um, as, uh, our grade level configuration, our, um, how we're gonna organize our schools, some of the I, I, some of the uh, work around our, our neighborhoods and our, our zones, and uh, different pieces of that of that puzzle. They were very specific in that feedback. They've shared it with certainly with uh, President Elliott, Vice President LeBron, Superintendent Myra Small, um, and uh, so that's going to be embedded in our present in our in our presentations over the next several months, so that we uh, we hit that hit all those benchmarks that they've set out for us. Uh, we're off to a very good start. We had a, a meeting with with State Ed. Um, Prior to uh, prior to July 1st, that was very productive, uh, and uh, Dr. Jello has set in on our um, our uh, uh, construction planning meetings to date, and also on all of our internal uh, conversations, whether it be our large group or um, some sub some some groups that are working on specific tasks. So we will continue to update you in that format, but also know that the state education department will be really walking. Uh, side by side with us as we do this, and we're going to call upon other members uh, or of, of the of the state education team to be able to provide some some uh, logistical support and some other input in regards to uh, uh, our final document. The uh, the key part that we talked about earlier is that, that the decisions informing this plan will be driven by the district with the input from the community. What that means in in context is that we have set an initial submission. Which I shared with you in one of the, which we shared with you in one of our documents. But ultimately, you as a board are going to vote vote on the final projects in December. Our goal is to be able to provide you a, a, a list, and we'll walk through some of the timelines here. But you are, you as a board, will be making the ultimate decisions on what schools are in phase three and what schools are are not in phase three, so to speak. And all that rationale as to why and, the, and the, all the different technical pieces of, of information and data that you will need in order to make an informed decision is what our role is between, uh, between now, um, actually July 1st, and when uh, your, our final decision needs to be made on November 14th. Uh, Carmine had mentioned, and uh, it's really important for us to, for, to reiterate that policy 4100, which is our grade level configuration policy, will be driving the work in phase three. So we, we, have, we have purposely aligned our, our initial submission with a pre-K-5, 6, 8, 9, 12 model. And as you can see, when we reorganize the school district into a pre-K-5, 6, 8, 9, 12 model, we're not only talking about our buildings that we're gonna be renovating, but also the, building, the, the remainder of the schools in our, uh, across our, our, our district that all, all are gonna be touched by these decisions and by this, re, by this reorganization. Um, and there's certainly more details that come on that, but we can't move forward on really any any work until we have a, a, a final decision on whether policy 4100 will be implemented or that policy 4100 will be adjusted. So um, in the legislation, we can renovate up to 12 schools and all then all those options will be, as we said, will be talked about here over the next several months in terms of uh, being able to provide data and, uh, and, and and informed input for you to make a decision. Um, we have a basically a three-step process. Step one is all the work and then an ultimate vote by the Board of Education at your December 22nd business meeting. We are working all of our planning back from that date. Um, it's important for us to hit that date because there are several key pieces of, of uh, work that need to be done 
after that in order to get a, uh, a, a timely submission to state ed for their review. Um, so, and, and what we're really trying to in, is, uh, is transition our plan uh, into state education department hands, give them every information they need in order to make their decisions. Um, as, I'm sorry, New York State Ed and the controller's office um, to make their decisions so that we can, uh, after, after their decisions are made, their approval, then we can go forth and hire our program manager, which once again comes back to the Board of Education because you must approve that hire as well. So you have, as you can see, you have multiple steps in this, uh, in this plan where you'll be called upon to make, uh, make key decisions as a, as a group on these, on these areas. Once you approve the, uh, the set of the schools that will be renovated, we will finalize the financial plan. We cannot make an informed decision on the front end, which by providing, um, uh, provide, by providing a level of, uh, of, uh, of data around you know, our capacity to do the work that we're talking about. So we'll be making, we'll be making some uh, financial, providing some financial information uh, as, we, as, as we look at different schools along the way. But ultimately, once those uh, projects have been selected, we'll then do a final financial analysis and provide that information to the controller's office. Obviously, we can't go above our local share number or our $475 million borrowing. So all that's all the work we uh, we would like to try to do has to come become in, in line with those two uh, those two numbers. The local share in this in this phase is up to five percent, and we're going to try our goal is to try to limit that as much as possible. Um, once the uh, once we have a submission in New York State Education Department, as I said, it will come back to us for a program manager selection. Once that selection has been made, then we hit the ground running with our with our projects and uh, and uh, we work into what would be the next step four of the of the phase three modernization program. Another key piece to, uh, for us to, before we transition to the next slide, is the schedule. The schedule is essential for us to make sure we make informed financial decisions. Availability of swing space, the scope of the work at particular schools. So that schedule will, um, will also be determined, um, probably in, in line with some of the decisions we're gonna make, but ultimately finalized as part of that financial plan because it, all different parts of that have an impact on that. The timing of these, the timing of these projects are, are really essential and we only have right now two swing spaces available to us, the Marshall campus and about, uh, about 60% of the Jefferson campus that are available as of tonight for us for swing space. Obviously that, that's a, a fluid conversation and we will be, uh, be finalizing that as part of our submission in December as well. As we outlined in, the, uh, in our June, uh, June conversation, we have uh, key deliverables for you by, by, our, by, by, the, uh, by, our, by your final decision date. Um, one, that we will have a core model, and that's what is, what is not only required in pre-K five schools, six, eight, and nine, 12, but also any additional items that we feel are a priority that we would like to have in our schools to be able to cost, uh, for us to cost out that, those type of models. Um, the other area here that's really essential is our, is our CTE decisions, career and technical education. Those are going to be embedded in, in, in much of that, uh, that core model. So we're going to meet, need to make a final decision about what our what CTE, off, CTE offerings we're going to have within the district. And those all have to be approved by state ed as well. So there's multiple areas where the state is weighing in on our decisions and our academic, our academic decisions as well as our, uh, our phase three decisions. So the partnership with, the, with them is, is absolutely essential. Our test fits. You can't make an informed decision without really understanding how these buildings can can accept a pre-K five, a six eight, and a nine twelve. It's pretty self-evident that we can't put a six eight or a nine twelve into school fifteen. So there are only certain buildings across our district that will be able to accommodate a six eight or nine twelve program. But once again, because we don't offer six eight across the district, we're going to have to address some of those buildings that could resonate. As in our decision-making process, it's going to be important that we align those expectate those decisions with um, with your decision as well, because ultimately that's going to drive a lot of the renovation part of it. So our test fits are going to be essential. You'll be you'll have information and data around those. Our demographic enrollment projections. That's one area that we have worked very closely with the state in regards to us providing not only accurate information but timely information. So we'll be providing that. And uh, we're working with the city in terms of neighborhoods and as well as tying it into our current zones, which was uh, our, the, our, our decision back in February was to maintain our three zone model, at least for the foreseeable future. 
Uh, the next item is an instructional space review and ISR is the acronym. We're gonna to try to make sure if we have acronyms, we, have, we give you the actual um, definition of those. And, and what will end up happening is an instructional space review is how you're gonna utilize this building in regards to your special education programming or continuum. So Desiree, uh, Chief Richmond and her team are gonna be working very closely with us to ensure that we have the continuum identified in the buildings that we're gonna renovate. But in essence, we can't make a lot of the decisions that we're gonna make without a district-wide for lack of a better way of saying it, an ISR. So almost an ISR for every single building would be part of this conversation as well. And we've had a number of conversations around this table as well as others around making sure that we have uh, continuums and, and alignment of special education services uh, that are equitable across the district. And this is our time to really put uh, our number three pencil at first to paper and then ultimately um, a final document that'll be part of this. The building aid unit calculations are also important for, and, and as we as we whittle down the list, when we get to uh, the 16, we're gonna talk uh, later around um, building aid units is how the state generates our revenue, our, our, re, our um, reimbursement on construction. And building aid units are generated by a variety of item, a variety of areas in an acronym, but the priority being the number of students that are in the school and the type of programming that is in that school. So we'll be calculating, you'll be learning more about building aid units as well as instructional space review throughout the coming months in order to make your, as I said, your informed decision. Um, and then finally, as we work our way into the timeline next, a final report, which will be delivered to you, not on December 22nd, because that's the vote, but uh, well before that in, in mid-November. And we will walk through that once in, in a moment with, in, terms of our, in terms of our timeline. But those are five key deliverables that will, you will have over the course of the next several months, some of those, the billing aid units, the instructional space review, the demographics, the test fits, and the core model you need before you can make your final decision. So you'll be, you will have those in front of you um, at work sessions in August, September, and October, which have already been identified, which I'll share with you in a moment. Next slide, Kelly. Um, this is also in your packet, obviously on the, on the, on the, on the, um, um, on our, on our presentation. It was just, we were just not able to um, make the uh, make it large enough in order to make it functional, which is why we shared it. So it's important that this is our initial submission. This was a submission that the uh, legislature legislature passed their the resol uh, our 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 our, uh, our bill on, and the governor signed our our legislation based upon this. Um, but we want to make sure we make informed decisions based upon uh, our, where we are in terms of the school district as we look into the into the twenty two uh, twenty three. Uh, 22, 23 school year and beyond. Um, these buildings were primarily selected and approved by the Board of Education at the December 2018 meeting. Well, an awful lot has changed since December of 2018 um, in terms of leadership, in terms of Board of Education uh, commissioners, uh, in terms of uh, city, uh, city representatives, um, executive and our mayor's office and so forth. So we felt it was important to kind of level set, bring us back to this, use this as our jumping off point, and then provide you our six, as we go through this process in, in August, September, and October, for you to make an informed decision to affirm that this will, conti will continue to be the model that will move forward, or if we need to make some adjustments based upon the other uh, uh, items that I had talked about earlier. And that would be the, the district-wide grade level configuration implementation, and uh, and some other some other areas. So this is not the final submission. I want to make that really clear to not only you but also the community that what you vote on in December will be the final submission that we'll move forward on. Um, and like I said, well, I can I can certainly take questions on that. I, I apologize for not having it large enough, but that's why I put it in your packet so you can review it more carefully. Okay, our timeline and opportunities for input. These are not the only opportunities for input. We wanted to put some markers out there, especially for the Board of Education, so that you know exactly when we're gonna come back to you for uh, at least work sessions now as, we've got, as we had them scheduled. And then also the legislation requires three uh, community engagement sessions. I think the legislation actually uses public hearings as their language. Um, so we have to have, that's the minimum we have to have, but we certainly need, we, we know from um, our, our past conversations, uh, our past public conversations that we need more community input in regards to this. So this is the baseline of these. Uh, we also feel like um, that these community sessions have to be different than just 
meeting in a, in a school auditorium, that we have to really bring this, um, bring these presentations and this information uh, out to where our community is. So in a sense, kitchen table conversations, for lack of a better way of saying it, those also should really be embedded in our, in our engagement plan. And uh, uh, certainly uh, Chief uh, Ramos Lopez will be essential in terms of getting, uh, working with us on a, on a uh, I, once again, I, I'm not using the word communication purposely, it's really an engagement strategy uh, because I think that's been, that, that's been missing in, the, in some of our past work. And, and we certainly have been, um, we've been, uh, we've had some public conversations around that lack of engagement in a whole variety of areas in our, within our school district. Um, so going back to the left, our, our next work session will be August 29th, and we will be reviewing our core model and any other items that we are able to finish by that 29th. So the baseline will be the core model program, and then we may be able to aspire to do um, some additional test fits. There's also some data that we, can, we may be presenting on, but that's the, uh, the, the primary target there is the core model, the, the 26th. We'll be uh, looking at our 10-year enrollment forecast and all of your test fits. Okay, that's that's a real key piece in terms of making some obviously some informed decisions on our final on our final grouping. And on the 25th, we break this down to a short list. We've once again another another review of test fits and some of the guiding uh, work here between the 26th and the 25th of October and uh, and, and the 29th and 20th, 26th of uh, September is our conversations in these work sessions our public deliberations around some of these, which will become very difficult decisions. Um, this is not gonna be easy work um, for us to, 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 to you know, really to walk hand in hand with, but it'll be, so some of the presentations here will be guided by our previous conversations. And then there's also, we also know there'll be some opportunities to meet with commissioners um, on, on a one-to-one uh, on a, on a -one basis or whatever, whatever President Elliott and Vice President LeBron uh, guide us with in terms of those engagements that we would be prepared for multiple uh, conversations within that within that window. Our final selection of schools is at a work session right right now, tentatively scheduled for November 14th. So you're going to take your as we went walk back, you're going to take your short list of 16, and you're going to knock it down to 12, or or less. It's ultimately your decision. It can be up to 12, and we will then use the the window of time between the 14th. And the 22nd, there'll be certainly some uh, public reaction to those that um, some of those the final selection of schools. There'll be uh, we will need to put together a uh, an initial uh, packet for state ed, and uh, so that work will be uh, completed during that window. And then ultimately, you'll have a resolution to approve the phase three strategic plan uh, at your December 22nd meeting. And as I alluded to earlier, that that ends up that takes care of our first stage. Uh, I do not want to minimize the amount of decision making that. Will possibly will need to be done between the 29th of August and the and the uh, and November 14th. Um, it you know it, we have we are affecting every single school in the district by this implementation, um, and uh, so I just want to make sure I reiterate that because I don't I want to make sure I I, uh, I I I provide the expectations as to, as to where they need to be. The, some of this will not be popular. Um, the decisions that we're going to have to make may not be popular, but we're going to we have to do them to make sure that we provide an informed decision. Around what final schools in order to, in order to spend the uh, 470, 475, 475 million dollars effectively. Uh, before we uh, questions, I, a couple of just uh, President Elliott, if I may, uh, in your packets we uh, we certainly have a copy of the slide deck. Um, we have the the, uh, the phase three initial program. Um, the other item which I didn't we didn't talk show as a as a doc as a um, document here is the phase three work plan but if you go through those if you go through those task items as i presented them in july and in, in june we are through basically with the a uh, a stage a stage um as of july 25th so we're right on schedule in terms of uh, meeting all the requirements that we had talked about in june and making sure that we uh we use the the, the money that was forwarded to us as uh, as as effectively as possible so um, our, our goal is to be able to provide you with an update in August that once again meets that task list and that timeline. So that's why we shared it again, because that's kind of your, your worksheet to follow along. Um, and then what we also will have to do is we're going to have to, as I described to you in June, there's two trains running time simultaneously. We, the A train, which is a lot of the technical stuff that we had talked about, and the B train, which is all those, initial, all those decisions 
that have been uh, have been uh, asked of us from our state monitor, asked of us from our um, from the state education department, and that you have set forth as ex expectations of us as well. So those three three areas are going to align into that B B train part of it, and that's really the though you'll see those implemented not only in the buildings that we're going to renovate, but also in the, all the schools that we're not going to renovate because like I said grade level configuration will change every single building in the school district. Um, and one of those areas that we're gonna bring forth is you know, a go live date for that implementation. Um, we've been working with Dr. Jello, uh, at least on some internal schematics. We cannot postpone this, right? So we are right now in number three pencil, but we're looking to implement uh, implementation of September of 24. So working your way back from September of 24 for full implementation of the grade level configuration plan that gives us not a lot of time to make sure we handle all the different aspects of, of what this will take. Um, everything op from operations to, uh, to instruction, uh, there's a lot of personnel that are involved. So there's a, there's a large heavy lift of items that'll need to be done outside of modernization, which makes us very different from phase one and phase two. The fact that we're tackling all the schools as well as, as, well as simultaneously renovating up to 12 buildings will make this a, uh, uh, a, a real effort on, for all of us. And it's gonna take a lot of patience, a lot of teamwork, a lot of collaboration, a lot of uh, kind of leaving your ego at the door, starting with mine, um, and uh, everybody really, really working together because as I said, this will be some very difficult conversations. And uh, our goal is to provide you as much information as possible so that you can make those informed decisions. So when community members find uh, happen to you come across at grocery stores and so forth, that you'll be able to provide them inf the most accurate information to date. And uh, I'll pause there, President Elliott. Thank, thank, thank you, Mike. Uh, a couple of questions that I have um, has to do with the criteria that we established. But before I get to that, one of the questions that I have is in terms of the grade level configuration or reconfiguration. Uh, we're not talking about paying for that out of the facilities monetization funding, are we? No, we're not. Okay. It would, right. not, be, it would not be eligible to do that. Right. The only, only buildings we can spend that money on are the buildings that we're going to renovate. Okay. Okay. And then, you know, in terms of, of criteria, at least in my mind, you know, what schools are the greatest needs that need to be uh, renovated? That That's one of the uh, criteria for me, equity in terms of, and we talked a little bit about this, Mike, equity in terms of the equal uh, or grade level configurations within the zone so that they're not, um, you know, um, that we've got uh, elementary schools, we've got um, middle schools, and we have um, the upper uh, level grades within each zone that makes it um, equitable is, is what we have to um, consider. And then also for me, you know, it's about, you know, the programs you mentioned about CTE and, and um, you know, those programs that we need to ensure that um, we are, um, you know, positioned for in terms of the way in which we need to have those buildings designed for those programs. So that's, that's something, you know, those are the, criteria that I'm looking at that should be considered. Uh, Commissioner Adams? I, I, I'm like concerned that you said simultaneous instead of like in phases. Um, if, if that's the case, um, Jefferson and Marshall alone is not going to, even though we had two schools in Marshall before, um, that's still only two schools and Jefferson is only partial use. Uh, what's on the table for um, more swings plays? Um, are we going to actually, let me ask this question. We're probably going to have to end up in, in this, something nobody don't want to hear. But if we're going to close the school, we're going to have to have, be talking about that as well. Um, and maybe end up using that as swing space. I don't know, but I know if we're doing it simultaneously, Instead of um, in phases, um, we're going to run out of swing space. Yeah, yeah, Commissioner. Let me uh, clarify. I don't want to. I don't want to confuse the community. So when I when I meant simultaneously is we only can do so many projects at once. I think in phase two we had four going on at one time. 
Um, but remember, East wasn't in swing space and we were able to do some work at Edison without moving the students out. But we did have that many projects, maybe even five going on at one time. Um, we, will, we will build the plan based upon the swing space that is available or swing, swing space we can identify over the coming months. When I meant simultaneously, I meant the implementation of our pre-K 5, 6, 8, 9, 12 model across the district will be done in a sense simultaneously with some of our renovations. Our renovations will have to be phased. The old CF phase three, A phase, B phase, C phase, whatever, whatever it is. You know, and our also our goal is to limit the number of phases. We want to do the work in as quick amount of time as possible because it's not getting less expensive. And with labor and supply chain and everything else, it doesn't behoove us to to put this out, you know, four or five years, six years out, because I just think we're gonna we're gonna get less um, less program for the resources that are available to us. So I think the balance is uh, on the construction side, making sure that we have utilizing our swing space as effectively as possible, and then and then tailoring our, our work plan around that. That'll drive a lot of the financial decisions. And, and I think you're also right that more swing spaces in our conversation may become available to us, and we have to take that into account as they as we move forward. Um, what we hope to do is be able to provide you an informed uh, together an informed set of uh, data sets around uh, the different impacts of, of K, pre K 5, 6, 8, 9, 12, and how they impact our building utilization, which then would may drive other conversations. But I think we, I, we, we're really being very careful here and very cautious about not getting too far out in front of ourselves because I don't think that, I think we've, we want to make sure that everybody is involved in this decision or to the extent possible. But the simultaneous, once again, is implementation, our own internal implementation. And simultaneously with the with the um, modernization renovations and the modernization rate modern and modernization renovations must must be staffed. There's no our, our, our phase. There's no way to do that without doing some level of phasing along the way. Commissioner Powell. Thank you, Madam President. So um, the number of times that the grade level configuration has come up in this conversation. Uh, has has made it incredibly obvious how important it is for the policy 4100 to be reviewed. Um, I've already put in the chat my um, um, my take on this, but for the public um, to to put it in its proper context, everything that uh, Mike Schmidt has just described about. The grade level configuration is based on what the policy currently reads. And the policy currently reads as it did uh, over a decade ago before Manny Rivera um, implemented the pre K 6 and 7 12 model, doing away with middle schools. And we never changed the policy. So kudos to. Um, Mr. Schmidt and the rest of the administration, they're following the policy as written. But what also needs to come into the conversation is that last year the board was presented with a proposal from the administration to in fact convert some of uh, our, our high schools from, from 712s into middle and high schools. And the board uh, essentially rejected that plan and the administration took that recommendation off the table. Um, so, th so the question I have as the policy chair is, does this board want a K-5, 6-8, 12 9-12 um, organization of instruction or does it want to essentially keep what um, Dr. Rivera brought to us, which was the pre-K 6 and 7 12. And that is so important for this board to come to uh, an agreement on because it would paralyze uh, the, the work of the FMP uh, based on just what Mike said about parallel tracks. You've got the FMP work and building classrooms and instructional um, um, space inventories that that had the the decision about what their organization of instruction is has to come first 
We can't do the FMP without settling that. Plus, if we agree to that, uh, that big change, then there's all of the academic work that has to go behind it, and which goes to your question, um, President Elliott, about you know what you know do, does the FMP pay for the change to the organizational instruction? So I hope I've made myself clear. My concerns are: uh, it seems to me that that reviewing policy 4100 is now part of the critical path. Commissioner Malloy. Thank you. I just want to agree with uh, Commissioner Powell to a certain extent. Um, I don't think it's an either or either. It's not just either K6, 712 or the other option. I think that we also have to look at maybe a K6 configuration and possibly a 7-8 configuration at middle school level and then 912 for high school. So I think there are really three options on the table. Commissioner Le uh, Vice President LeBron. Yeah, thank you, President Elliot. I just kind of want to add, though, like, as we're having these conversations that we actually have to make a decision, though, like, soon. And I think that is what Mike is reiterating. Just saying, like, it's on a critical path doesn't mean anything unless we actually align it to some of the dates that Mike and um, Carmine are presenting today to this board. Um, I know that that's the policy, but we have not followed that policy, and I have no idea how long probably since Manny Rivera was here, um, because the reality is we have about nine different configurations minimally right now within the district that are not aligned whatsoever with our board policy. So I really hate when we bring up policies or try to uphold them now after like a decade or more of never <laughs> holding up to them. Um, so I would just say that this board um, by tonight, to be honest, should be making a decision if we want to uphold the policy or if we want to move forward and reconfigure and have that conversation at the next work session regarding FMP because it is going to tie into the state approving, as you all know, the legislation change and the state is now involved in not only um, giving us input and support, but they also have a say. There's the FMP board and then there's the RCSD board. So it's a lot of people um, waiting on the RCSD board to make the decision of what reconfiguration will look like or not look like um, so that the plans can move forward. And before the community themselves can start giving us input into um, how these dollars should be spent in their schools and what those um, re restructuring should look like, they do need to know the direction that the district is going to take regarding that. And I just want to say, like, we were not presented with a reconfiguration plan last year alone. What we were presented was school closures, reconfigurations, um, transportation, and a whole bunch of changes all at once that did, were too convoluted and not data-driven enough to make good sense for this board to support that and move forward. And so as we move forward, we should be looking at good data to make decisions, um, but also not rushing through very critical decisions. So I think it's a balance that we have to find and not mixing all of it at once, not talking about school closures and reconfigurations at the exact same time, because you may not get the support in that way. I do think um, we should look at perhaps having the conversation, like I said, deciding how the board tonight wants to move forward. Do we want to uphold this policy or do we want to look at potentially changing it? Because I think that would give even Commissioner Powell with direction on what she needs to do as chair of policy if we may fast track it or not. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner uh, Malloy, did you have a question? I see your hand down. All right. Um, Adrian? Uh, yes, uh, President. I just uh, just a quick note to the, the board um, uh, to be wary of kind of entering comments in the chat. I don't know the, you know, the, the conversation should really be accessible to the public. So I don't know that the public can see those those chat uh, communication. So I think, um, you know, we just want to be careful and, and you know, raise, raise a hand and, and come on camera and say your comments um, is, is probably the appropriate way to, to move forward. Th thank you for, for that. Uh, any other uh, questions or comments uh, from um, board members? 
So I, I'm of one. I'm of the opinion that if we have policy, we need to be following um, those policies. And of course, of course, if we need to change those policies, you know, we we can change them. But we do need to be following uh, the policy. If we don't, why do we have a policy committee? And so it's just really important to me that we are uh, aligning the work that we do with the policy, knowing that we haven't done in many regards we haven't done in the past, but we certainly need to to be doing that um, moving forward. And so I think the next step is, you know, what is, do we want to adhere to the policy that we already have or do we want to change it? And, and certainly if we're looking at changing that policy, which can take about, what, three months or so going through the, the, uh, the process of um, developing a new policy. So I think we have to look at that and we have to look at, you know, whether or not we want to uh, maintain this policy because indeed this is going to um, uh, we'll have some time challenges if you will if we look at you know having to develop a new kind of policy or even amending the one that that we have and so um, you know I think that that's got to be part of the conversation we've got to come to a definitive um, decision about, you know, do we want to go with this policy or do we want to look at changing the other, changing it? Now, you know, the, the current um, plan is the K through five, six through eight, nine through 12. However, P Commissioner Malloy mentioned six through eight, you know, so we, we've got to come to some resolution. Commissioner uh, Malloy, did you want to respond to that? Oh yeah, I just mentioned that the possible configuration could be okay. like seven, eight, but smaller middle schools, which data supports. Okay, all right. Commissioner LeBron, uh, Vice President LeBron. No, I just wanna, um, I think we should take a roll call actually tonight, President Elliott, so that we kind of know where people are at in terms of how we wanna move, because I would love for us to leave here with like next steps. And if people majority wanna uphold the policy as it's written, there is some reconfiguration that will happen anyway. So. I just wanna be clear to the community and to even our school staff listening, regardless of how the board votes or which direction they go with reconfiguration, schools are going to be impacted and they're gonna be reconfigured. If we follow our policy, they're going to be impacted because that is not the reconfigurations in most of our schools. We don't even mention pre-K, so I do think there has to be some language update to the policy anyway to include pre-K. Um, but our schools go right now to sixth grade to eighth, some go up to 12. So there's still going to be an impact. So I don't want to give the community the illusion that there may not be any impact whatsoever if we uphold the policy. If we uphold the policy as it's written or even amended to include pre-K, there will still be some impact. And if we um, have a roll call and we choose to reconfigure, there's going to be an impact in that regard too. So either way, there's going to be an impact to our schools across the entire district and the community. And I just want folks to know that now, but I would like us to have a roll call so that we know which direction the board wants to go when we leave here tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President. Um, Commissioner Simmons, your hand is raised. Thank you, President Elliott. Um, considering a roll call, if we're, if we're gonna um, go into that, um, I, I'm not even going to um, go too far. I'll just echo the sentiments expressed already. So we know there's going to be an impact one way or the other. With that impact, um, I think pre-K should be, obviously it needs to be considered in there. And I do like, I, I lean more towards the pre-K through five, six through eight, and then the nine through 12, based on our students' um, learning needs and um, the fact that we need to get to our students a lot earlier than what we are getting to them. And I think that model is um, ideal. If we go with another one, those are the only other model that I'm um, considering is the K through six, seven through eight, nine through 12. But my, the latter is the one I prefer. So that's where I am with it. And whatever we need to do to get this rolling, um, I'm ready to do that because we're impacting our students one way or the other every time we continue to uplift old policies that we're not even following. So let's let's move forward and save our children, right? Thank you. Commissioner Malloy. Thank you. Just wanted to uh, share why I support a K-6 model versus, and 7-8 at middle school level. 
has more to do with when we look at overall staffing of buildings. And I think that it's going to, uh, sixth grade is still an elementary certification. I think we're going to have an easier job of, and I could be, you know, not making much sense here, but I'm assuming that it's going to be easier to staff a building with just seven, eight versus six through eight, because it requires those other certifications. And it is still considered elementary school at the New York state level. So I think it's more in line with curriculum that New York state has rolled out. Um, and just data supports having smaller seven, eight, seven go eight middle schools, and then really helping kids get ready for that ninth grade year. Um, and by keeping kids at the sixth grade level, at the elementary school level, um, helps we can help prepare them for the middle school experience. Um, many of those kids just aren't ready to, to be in a middle school environment with seventh and eighth graders. Commissioner Powell. Uh, yeah, just to weigh in on that, um, I certainly would prefer to see pre-K six. Uh, we only have pre-K in about half of our schools. And even if we um, continue to uh, have agency pre-K throughout the city, um, we, um, we, even if we only have use half of all the available seats uh, for pre-K and uh, in our buildings, if every building had pre-K, uh, we would be in a better position uh, with that pre-K through six model than we currently are because schools that do not have pre-K are at an enrollment disadvantage. Families don't sign their kids up for kindergarten in a school that if they, if they weren't in the, that school already in pre-K. Um, it's the same dilemma that we had before we had full day kindergarten. Schools that have full day kindergarten had a distinct enrollment advantage when it came to uh, families um, choosing kindergarten and, and staying in that school going uh, uh, through to the terminal grade. I also support K-6 and 7-12 because the fewer transitions, the, the less um, disorientation to the students. Uh, when we had, when we did have middle schools, that was two transitions in the life of a child. Um, assuming they stayed in the same school throughout elementary school, they were, they were transitioning at the fifth grade to sixth and then at the seventh, uh, the eighth grade to ninth. And um, there was some, there were some experts saying that those transitions were, um, uh, were setbacks to our students. Um, finally, I would like to echo what Commissioner Malloy said about just the practical organization of our teaching force. The certifications are elementary, which is K through six, and secondary, which is seven through 12. If we didn't learn anything from the, our, from the experiment of the pre-K through eight, uh, you'll recall when we, when we opened a few schools as pre-K that were previously pre-K six and changed them to pre-K eight, we had uh, so few sections in seventh and eighth grade that we weren't getting the right teaching, the teachers in. We weren't offering the science and the social studies that was needed at the um, seventh and eighth grade level. Uh, it, it, it resulted in some really disastrous outcomes in a couple of instances. Um, and that was just bringing seventh and eighth graders into the, the pre-K six environment. Imagine, um, if we were to suddenly create six through eight uh, configuration, we'd have a, a third of the building would be elementary teachers who would hold all of their students, uh, uh, who would hold all the sixth grade students in essentially this one classroom with the exception of the specials. And then two thirds of the classroom of the, of the uh, building's enrollment would be changing from period to period uh, in the same way high schoolers do. Um, but you'd have, to, you'd have to be sure that you could um, staff the buildings uh, essentially with full-time social studies, full-time math, full-time 
science, full-time English teachers, because otherwise you're increasing the number of itinerant teachers, which we also know is detrimental to students because those teachers don't get to know their students as well if they're having to um, shuttle between one or um, two or more schools. So there, there are a lot of practical reasons for a pre-K six and a seven twelve organization of instruction. Um, and it's been hashed over many times. There, are, there used to be a strong argument for middle schools um, and, and that's what they do in the suburbs, but the suburbs have a lot more resources that they've been able to put towards counselors and other uh, emotional supports for the middle school or school age kids. And when we tried it, we failed because we did not have the resources to do it and to implement it with the same fidelity that our suburban neighbors did. Um, I know that Dr. Jallo and um, Superintendent Myra Small were advocating for returning to that model and saying that there, there is some research, but I would argue that that research is kind of um, questionable, that it that it's runs in uh, contrast with our lived experience um, and and I'm not sure what the what the outcome might be because of that so that's that's my input on that subject thank you vice president LeBron yeah I would need to see some data on some of the stuff that was said because it doesn't align to what I know but a couple of things one people our parents who select pre-K, whether it's in a school or a CBO, but I wanna focus on the school piece, does not necessarily mean that they get to stay in that school. And that has been an issue that has bubbled up time after time again. We just had a meeting with the children's agenda based on a report that they put out with recommendations around that transition piece. And essentially managed choice has to be changed. And also how we communicate to families, how they select the pre-K, doesn't necessarily mean that they get to stay in that pre-K because of our own managed choice. So I don't want the community to hear that and make an assumption that that's just going to solve the enrollment or declining enrollment issues in the school. It won't. It, it will help if parents, when they select the pre-K, they're allowed to stay in that school after that selection has been made, whether they live in the zone or not. I think that's a larger conversation for the board to have. The other thing, our schools are not fully staffed now. So to say like, you know, staffing will be a better issue for pre, I don't wanna use staffing as an excuse or reason to make a decision when we are not fully staffed now. And we're not fully staffed now heading into this new school year. We are doing some outreach efforts and we'll talk about that more at the board business meeting. However, the fact remains that we are short staffed um, in the teaching as well as Vente and RAP, food services, custodial, and a number of positions are still short staff. Um, I personally, if we're roll calling where people are at, whether to stick with the policy or not, um, one, I, we should add pre-K to whatever policy we, we decide. Um, but I do, do want to support middle schools um, separate from just uh, from, uh, I don't want to support a 712 model. I think we have those models. I think those models don't work. I think it's evident that they don't work and they're more challenging. Um, and it's always, I, there's a lot of irony for me when we, we talk about the management of a school and lower enrollment in a building, but then we want to close buildings and stuff even more kids. And there's so much irony in that for me, but I would love to support a pre-K six um, seventh, eighth, seventh, eighth, ninth as an option to 10, 11, 12, or 9, 10, 11, 12. Um, so any configuration, any combination of that configuration, I would support. If the board majority said we want to support 7, 8, and then 9 through 12, I would support that. I'm not gonna, that's not a hill I'm going to die on. But what I don't think works is having a policy we, that we don't follow, that we have nine configurations. And it's very confusing for parents all over the community when you have a child in one school and their configuration could be essentially pre-K through 12, and then you have a child in another school and their configuration only goes to six. And then I would like to bring this back up that right now, currently in the Northwest, 
there are no seventh through eighth options for any student who lives in the entirety of the Northwest District. Second largest quadrant in the city of Rochester, no seven eighth option through RCSD. And, and how this things happen is because previous boards and administrations made decisions to close schools, did not look at neighborhood makeups, did not look at birth rates by zip, by zip codes, did not look at um, the impact of those decisions, right? And now we end up with pre-K six schools primarily only in the Northwest and one high school that just got converted because we closed the boys school seven through 12. So whatever decision we make, I, I wanna support that we change the policy and reconfigure and that's one vote. And I don't know, I think Commissioner Malloy is on that same wavelength. I would like to hear from other commissioners so that again, we can decide how we're moving forward after this work session. Thank you, President Elliott. Thank you, Commissioner Adams. Yeah, I, I uh, support putting everything on the table. <laughs> and so um, I think we need, need to have a discussion. I'm really concerned about this um, 6 through 12 and 7 through 12. Um, even though my kids went through that, um, I'll be honest with you, um, my kids are a little different than the average kid. Um, but for most kids, um, that's been an issue. That's been an issue at East. Um, a lot of the fights. It's a lot of lot of stuff I I, I could break down. Um, this a concern for me. Um, so I definitely my my thing is what I'm saying is this. We need to put everything on the table and we need to talk about it really soon. We need to um, we can't be dragging this out. Um, September is right around the corner. That's, um, that's my, my vote. Yeah, let me just go to Commissioner Patterson because I haven't heard him um, on um, on camera. So you had made comments in the um, in the chat, and you heard what um, our general counsel said. So um, tell me your thoughts, um, Commissioner Patterson. Well, we uh, around the school for, for me. For me, it's pretty easy. You have two choices. All you guys just named the two choices, either one through six and then seventh, eighth, and nine, tenth, and eleventh, or you said, what was the other choice? One through, what was the second choice? One through six, seven, eight, uh, nine through twelve. Right, that's what I just said, but there's another choice too on the table. Um, there are a number of choices that we just uh, talked about. There is one through um, yes. one through six, seven through twelve. Uh, there was one through um, six. six, seven through nine, um, nine, twelve. So, you're, you're right, so what, I'm sorry. You're currently reviewing two different options in your conversation. The first is the what we talked about at length: pre K, pre K five, six, eight, nine, twelve, and then the second option you've discussed anyway was uh, a pre K. Six, seven, eight, nine, twelve. Those are the two options we've been right. discussing. So, so I'm I'm for either one of those. You guys make a decision on what you want. We have a vote on those, and I'm ready to vote. So, just All those right. two for me. I'm not for seven through twelve, but um, those okay. two choices that Mike just uh, indicated, um, I'm fine with either one of those. Okay, Kelly, let me just have you to jump in. I see your hand raised. Yeah, um, I'm just highlighting the fact that. Um, uh, Deputy Peluso is trying to speak as well, but he, he's not able to raise his hand for some reason. I think we're experiencing a little bit of Zoom difficulty still. So, All right. So let me call on Commissioner Powell, and then uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Peluso, I'll call on you. Oh, uh, President Ali, I was probably the last person to put my hand up. Uh, Commissioner Simmons' hand was up before me, and then Lieutenant, uh, Vice President uh, uh, LeBron's hand went up about the same time mine did. So if, if you want to take things in a different order, I'm happy. There are no more hands raised on my screen. So I don't know if that's a technical issue. No, there's no, no more hands raised. Uh, all, okay. right. all right. So so let me just summarize by saying um, that the big, I heard a lot of support for pre-K six, uh, maybe even an maybe even the majority of the board for the pre-K six. 
And uh, the dilemma being that the current policy a five. So I would be happy to draft a uh, revision to the policy that um, that stipulates pre-K six um, if there if there is clearly a, a support for that amongst the seven of us. Um, then the and then the question is, are we going? To, do we want seven? seven and eight middle schools and then nine twelves. Uh, Commissioner Malloy suggested seven through nine and then 10 through 12. I didn't uh, suggest seven through nine, sorry. I just want to reiterate seven, eight. You, just, you, were, you were stipulating seven through eight. Somebody, I thought somebody said seven through nine, but um, I personally can live with returning to a seven, eight and nine, 12 model. What I really don't want to see us do is go back to a K-5. Uh, I think that there that are real practical problems with that. Um, so if you have, if uh, President Elliott, you have, uh, if someone's been taking notes and we know where everyone stands on that, I can draft revisions to the policy that include a seven, eight, and nine. Well, let me just, before you do that, I really am interested in a seven through nine model. And the reason that I like to have the nine in the middle school is because of the kinds of issues that our young people who are in ninth grade face. I think that if they can take advantage of those additional supports that are gonna be needed for seven, eight, I think that they are a part of that, um, that, that, that human, that, that, transition phase where they're going to need those those supports too and so that they are able to more effectively and efficiently enter into um, high school. I think that that ninth grade and I know that Dr. Jallo talked about a ninth grade academy um, that you know that we have to also um, um, consider as well but somehow I think that not somehow I think it's important that as many resources that, as we can pro provide to those ninth graders. And I think part of doing that will be in that, for me at least, seventh, eighth, and ninth grade configuration. That, that, that's where I am on that. Hey, uh, Commissioner Patterson, can I just, um, I'm gonna let uh, Dr. Peluso speak and I'll get to you after he speaks. So thank you, Dr. Peluso. No, thank you, President Elliott. I, th I think ultimately, and you are all on the right track regarding um, the discussion, but for us to move forward, we really have to have some guidance today. And I just you know, don't wanna to leave today okay. without having some guidance in terms of a direction. If we're gonna revise a policy, what that's going to look like. Um, if we do keep ninth graders in a seven, eight, ninth format, the implications of that also on our other policies, because currently sometimes if the kids don't reach credits, they don't, transition to 10th grade, okay. that means they All stay right. in ninth grade as well. So how do we handle that bubble? Well, I do agree with Dr. Jell, we need ninth grade academies and supports in our ninth grades as well. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Patterson? Yeah, I agree with that. Since um, it, it did come from Dr. Dr. Jell, I was thinking about that. The reason why is because Fairport has that model where they have ninth grades all going to one school. So um, I'd also, that would be my priority to be honest with you. Um, so have ninth grade on its own, um, seventh, eighth, and uh, P PK uh, through six, and uh, like I said, 10 through, through 12. But if we could do that, if we had the space, I think it's a great idea because that age group right there, like you said, uh, um, a couple of people on the screen said, that's a very telling year, that ninth grade year. And I think seventh, eighth, they have enough issues on their own that we could deal with. So if it's uh, available, uh, that will be my priority, but, um, you know, uh, that'll be my first choice. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. I just want to, uh, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, because I can't raise my hand. I just want to, when I was saying ninth, ninth grade academy as, as a structure in a 912 building as well. And I don't, I think mm -hmm. also Fairport has moved away from the ninth grade academy uh, yeah, they? anymore. Yeah, but 912 having an academy within that structure. And some of our schools are beginning to have those conversations in the secondary. Oh. Thank you. Commissioner Powell. Um, so can I just, uh, uh, 
two things. First, can I test for understanding that there is support for, or, uh, that there's pretty much universal support for case uh, pre-K six, just just to talk about that alone for, for just a split second? Where where does everybody stand on? Well, can can we do this? Let me, let me I he, see Doc, I see uh, the Vice President's hand again, and I saw uh, Dr. Jallo's hand again. Can we have those conversations before we do this kind of poll? And I see uh, Commissioner Malloy. So uh, Dr. Jallo. Hi, yes, um, good evening. I apologize, my camera is not working, otherwise I would be on screen. Um, I was just hoping that maybe we could use a little data as part of this conversation. And perhaps um, if administration had access to any of the secondary principles about their preferences about the configurations. Um, my background is originally as a middle school um, teacher and uh, principal. And one of the things about having only two grades, um, that's a quick transition, number one. Number two, the minute the kids get in, you get to know them, they're right out. It's, 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 it's only two years and there's some challenges with that. And there's some challenges around accountability in that you have them for such a short period of time. Um, but you know, that's just been my experience over the years working with middle school populations. That population changes so quickly um, just because of that age group to have them and get to know them and meet their needs in such a short period of time is usually pretty difficult. Um, but with that being said, it would be nice if administration could give the board some input from people in the field who are working with these students to see if they had any input or ideas around the configuration of um, school. All right, thank you. Commissioner Malloy. Thank you. I think a concern is that a seven through nine model um, has proven in the past at least to be a disaster because that, that creates larger schools. And I think most of the data that we're seeing shows that smaller middle schools providing a more intimate focused environment for students is where we're gonna see student success. Um, I do support ninth grade academies within um, high schools. And I think another thing that we have to consider is also the ripple effect of having a seven through nine grade level configuration and what that would do on some of our extracurriculars. Most notably, a lot of our ninth graders are part of um, sports. Um, what would that do district wide to our sporting programs? Mm -hmm. How would that affect transportation? I just think there's a lot of ripple effects that we'd have to consider. Um, oh, we're in agreement. I am absolutely against seven through nine because <laughs> the accountability system in the state of New York, actually across the country, is such that ninth grade is when the accountability clock starts to, starts for high school. Um, how well you have children graduating in four years, or, or you know how many graduate, everything is based on the moment they cross the doors of ninth grade into any high school. So if you have your ninth grade in a place other than a high school or a high school setting, that particular school of seven nine is going to have to go through the accountability of a middle school plus the accountability of a high school at the same time, which means they're twice as likely to be challenged because they're going to be under two totally different accountability systems in um, the state of New York, the seven eight, and then the accountability system for high school. So, so I, I that one would be a no no for yeah. me. So I'll me. take that off the table, but I still. Oh, no, no. I'm just, 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 <laughs> just throwing in something. Right, food no, but, for but it makes That's sense. It, it makes sense uh, on both levels. Um, but, I, but, but what I would accept is that if we, because we know the issues that face that our ninth graders face, we, but we, and we've got to have social supports around them. And, Absolutely. And, and this academy that Dr. Jolly, you were talking about, you know, that may be the ideal to do it because we've got to get our ninth graders on the right track. Um, and if we can get them on the right track, they have a better success of graduating from high school. So, but I thought that middle school model would be the way to go. No, agreed. And research supports yeah. that entirely. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Vice President LeBron. I would support um, a, a set of, so I hear you what you're saying, Dr. Jallo that the two year turnaround is tough, but what we're doing now is not working either. So at this point, 
I don't want to use what, you know, and our own data shows that it doesn't work. So um, I would just uplift that. So I'm, I'm willing to bet that this district has not tried 7A and fully funded 7A the way that it needs to be funded. And there should be a special formula specifically for 7A. It is a difficult transitional um, time for kids but also hormonally, their brain chemistry, all of those things are factors that we just can't take for granted as it just doesn't exist. There's lots of data around those students as well. Um, and I know, cause I got a sixth grader coming up and I'm ready to yoke her every day right now. And she hasn't even officially started sixth grade, but she will in 54 days. So I just wanna put that out there. Like, here we go, round three. This Understood. is that age where they really start testing you. So yeah, I just wanna throw that out there. But um, <laughs> I would support, I'm sorry, Shiley, no, I was going to say, I would support a, a, a ninth grade academy, though, within a nine twelve model. Again, like I said, I'm not, this is not a hill I'm, I'm willing to die on. I just do want us to leave here today with some direction for the administration, um, particularly Dr. Peluso and, and Mike, um, because as Mike has mentioned, there are like multiple moving trains in the FMP piece, but this is a critical part of how they even get to look at reconfigurations of buildings based on the reconfig reconfiguration of grades and how that may or may not impact e the construction, if you will. Um, so we can leave that part to rest. Now, I want to point out that Dr. Jallo academic plan, um, the board did vote on this already, but I would argue that there were different board members. And so we just have to make a final decision with this board so that we can move forward um of what that looks like and i do think um uh, president elliot and i could be off um which is why i asked for a roll call that i know i like i said myself it sounds like commissioner malloy it sounds like commissioner adams um it actually i heard a little bit from commissioner S uh, patterson and i also think commissioner simmons sounds like we are majority in the mindset of changing the configurations and not upholding our current policy. And I think that's a start. Thank you, Commissioner Powell. Uh, okay, so um, I'll just, I wanna respond to what Vice President LeBron said about what, when we voted uh, to support the uh, academic plan, Dr. Jello's uh, proposal that we voted on didn't say that we would do the great configuration she proposed. It said that we would consider it, that we would um, uh, consider a proposal, research it, and, and respond to the administration. And, and we did respond to the administration once, and it, it wasn't very clear. It didn't provide clear guidance. So um, yeah, it does sound to me like there's uh, it, and if I get this wrong, would, would any board member please just shout right out that the policy, the Organization of Instruction Policy 4100 should read pre-K 6, 7, 8, 9, 12. And if I don't hear any objections, I will bring to the board a, a draft that does that well hold on to that let me just have we've got more conversation commissioner simmons but that sounds like it would be it, 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 it sounds that way commissioner powell but we've got more conversation commissioner simmons um thank you president ellie um yeah because there was there were just two models that i was considering and the latter which uh commissioner powell just mentioned as well as several other commissioners is consistent with it sounds like the majority of us are on track with the um, pre-k through six seven through eight and nine through twelve the comment that i wanted to make um was around just the ninth grade academies and i don't know if this is it's not rhetorical it's actually a no i'm going to ask the question what are we as a board prepared to do to make sure the ninth grade academies are supported and that they actually happen because there's been a lot of talk around ninth grade academies for a long time even prior to me becoming a board member and i remember a, a, there was a chief in place that was trying to um set that up across the district at one point in a pilot level program and when that person went out 
as did the ninth grade academies. And so, and we know that it is something that is essential for the success of our students. So I just want to really put that out there because it sounds really good. And I know we have these really strong conversations that sound really good, but what the heck are we prepared to do to make sure it happens? That's what I want to make sure we keep our pulse on. What are we going to do to make sure the things we say are important to us actually happen and have staying power? Thank you. Commissioner um, Adams? I hate to my, don't try to press me into saying what um, is, um, that I want K through six, because I, I'm, I'm just putting on the table my feelings about different stuff. I also know that um, six through eight should be um, grouped together because the, um, modified af athletics is getting, re and getting ready to include sixth graders. Um, and sports is a big deal. Um, same reason that, that Commissioner Malloy, they were talking about keeping ninth grade with the seniors is, is because of the sports. Sports is a big deal. And so we have to keep into consideration um, the sixth graders are getting ready to be included with modified um, athletics. Um, of course, we, we changed the policy and we, we probably can deviate from the policy, but let's just not be so by night, by for night. In, in our decisions, um, because there's a lot to think about here. Um, so, so. No, what I was going to say, Commissioner Adams, but to uh, Commissioner Malloy's point about the um, certification that you would have to have if it went to, say, for example, a six through eight model, you, there may have to be a um, two certifications or du dual certification, one for elementary school and one for um, high school, am I, am I correct in, in what I'm saying? So that's the, the concern and that's, at least for me, uh, my thinking around the, the, um, the configuration of pre-K through six as opposed to six through eight uh, because of that. So yeah, Commissioner Powell. Okay, cool. so uh, if, if there's no other hands up. There, yeah, I, can, I, can I just, Answer that for a minute. Yeah, because your Come hand on. was not, yeah, I don't see your hand. So some hands I'm not seeing. I'm so uh, please, Dr. Jow, go ahead. Yeah, I just, um, I would caution that you take a look at your sixth grade data from iReady, your sixth grade data from your report cards, your sixth grade data to see what's going on. I would also suggest that you look, ask the Department of HCI to give you data about your teachers how many teachers are certified in one way or the other. Your sixth grade data suggests, suggests that teachers with, um, with the general um, elementary certification versus teachers that have the specialty, they may offer a different level of um, content to your students. And I think before you jump one way or the other, it might be important to actually look at the data. Your sixth grade data is, 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 is troubling, um, but also just look at the certification of teachers and where are they now and how that might impact you if you go six, eight or seven, eight or, or keep the sixth graders in the elementary school. I also think that if you keep the sixth graders with elementary, but you include them in sports, Someone needs to give you data that shows how much it's going to cost you in transportation. Because now you will have to transport these students from or these middle elementary schools in addition to your secondary school versus if they were all in secondary school. So I'm not trying to sway one way or the other. I have my own opinions, but I'm just saying I think there's some data that you need to um, become familiar with to help guide you in your decision making. Okay, I'm going to. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I raise Go my ahead. hand. Sure. I apologize. Um, just to, sixth graders right now in the state of New York, New York cannot participate in any um, inter interscholastic sports outside. So they can't be a JV athlete or varsity athlete. Like once you hit seventh grade, you could do testing to participate in JV or varsity. But prior to that, you can't. And I don't know if there's going to be any changes to that in the near future. So I don't want that to to be there. Um, the six through eight model, just to give um, 
best practice around this model is just so some more information as you talk about it is in most schools that do a six eight model sixth grade teachers become content specific right you know so a sixth grade teacher would teach only english in a middle school schedule model so they'll go through a ninth period day or an eight period day that sixth grade teacher will teach english or a sixth grade teacher will take social teach social studies and they create teams in the school to kind of create that structure now like has been mentioned, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade schools and middle schools done well is going to require additional supports, right? You're gonna need the counselors, you're gonna need social workers, you're gonna need all those additional supports to make them well. But I just wanted to correct a couple of things about sixth grade students playing middle, playing sports, interscholastic sports, and how they would structure a middle school. Thank you. I'm gonna to go to Vice President LeBron. So like my request tonight is not that we actually have a final plan, but it was more of, are we gonna uphold the policy or we're gonna move in a different direction? Because we're gonna have to have more work sessions. I would love data on all of these factors and I will do my own research as well to see what other districts out there may exist with successful um, models that work. And then, and, and then just the last piece in, in terms to Commissioner Simmons questions, like what are we prepared to do when we have these great conversations? Um, that's a good question. It, it's up to the board to decide if they're going to um, solidify some of these um, conversations by board policy through the budget. And we're all uh, accountable to do that work. Because I do think um, that if we move forward and we say we want a ninth grade academy, that that should be in policy and that that should be reflected in the budget. And again, even when I brought up seventh, eighth, I'm saying seventh, eighth cannot be under resourced, underfunded because it's only two grades. It has to be fully resourced, fully funded. And if anything, have even more resources um, than one would think it needed because that's the amount of resources it's gonna need for the transition. Um, in terms of the academic data, I, I just wanna say the academic data is dismal for the entire district and it has been for decades. I And I'm not saying that we ignore that data, but I'm saying that we have to make some configurations and some decisions despite that data because we know what that data looks like with a plan to address that data. Um, and again, that has to be fully funding your middle schools. And if you're gonna do a ninth grade academy, that should be fully funded as well. It cannot be like we're all just there and we're gonna slap together an academy and, and not fund it and, and be pulling teachers from 10th, 11th, 12th to fund it and support it or re none of that can happen. We have to have a solidified um, plan, whether it's in the budget, written, and that everybody understands it throughout the entire district. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Patterson. All right, let me come back on camera. Um, Again, uh, for me, even though I have my own assumptions, I don't like to assume. So what's the advantage of this major change that we're about to make or undertake? Anyone can answer that. Anyone want to answer Dr. Caluso? So an advantage in terms of organizing the district in a common, whatever, whatever it may be, pre-K six, pre-K five, seven, eight, nine, 12, obviously limits the number of transitions that we currently have, right? You know, provides us an opportunity to potentially do some more zoning around schools, right? And have a structure around zones as well. So I think from us, it also lets us maximize some of our resources, look at how we're designing our instruction K-12, and then also equity across the board, right? You know, we have so many different models and so many different equity provides us the opportunity to give equity. Is it equity against what did you say? That last equity piece was- Equity across the board, right? You know, in terms of seven, eight, nine, 12, what does it look like? Um, one of the things through FMP, and I know Mike could talk about it, is we create test fits for what does a K-6 look like in every one of our buildings? What does 7-8 look like if that was the way? Or 6-8 and what's 9-12 look like to provide um, equity across so that there's no off shoots of any of this. Okay, yeah, I just want a general response. So in case I'm asked, thank you. Commissioner Powell. 
Okay. Um, a bunch of thoughts went through my head. So let me just go back to the one question I didn't get to ask before. Um, um, uh, by way of introduction, you know, in, before Charlotte was a high school, it was an, a middle school. And so that Northwest Quadrant only had a middle school, didn't have a high school. Um, so th th that was that was a trade-off. So my question is, with this test fitting and so on, is it possible to uh, do schools within schools and have a middle school and a high school in the same physical structure? I, I get it that it might not be optimal, that, that the whole point of having middle schools separate from high schools isn't just because the accountability piece, but also to um, reduce the, the overall size and to um, put the younger students in a smaller environment with, without the um, presence of larger, older children. But is, it, is that something that would uh, be part of the test fit scenarios? <clears throat> I'll try to respond to your question, Commissioner Powell. Um, we are trying to limit the number of test fit scenarios that we, we take on. Um, it's very resource heavy in order to do it with, uh, with fidelity. And so the more, we, the more we take on in terms of uh, looking at the, the test fit option or more, more additional test fit we take on, it's also going to increase the amount of time the amount of resources. So that's why we're trying to hone in on um, making a decision before we invest uh, resources into that into that model. I think we we are committed to test fitting what the board's decision is. So you can see what the impact is across the district. I hope I'm trying to I hope I answer your question correctly. So um, you know there's only so many buildings that can be a seven eight. And what are the what are the essential part needs and, and I think Vice President Brown just said it, what are the resources that a seventh, seven and eighth grade campus needs and there, what buildings would be able to serve uh, uh, correctly for those students. And if, a, you know, and if you choose a building that falls a little short of, of that, what are we prepared to do to make sure that building does meet the expectations of our district? And uh, I think one caution, note of caution is in, your, in the previous iterations, um, especially phase one of prior to when I got here, was we put a lot of big additions on a lot of buildings for a K-8 plan and at a K-12 school that we look back may not have been possibly the, the best use of those resources going forward. That's why we're really trying to be deliberate here about making the, uh, an ultimate decision and then mirror the, the building stock, so to speak, after that decision. So I'm not sure if I totally answer your question, but you know, testing fit multiple grade level configurations really isn't feasible in, in this window of time um, and also would be very cost prohibitive. So I think um, if, and you know, this is a, they're obviously a very difficult decision to make. So I, I think if we're, if we're struggling around time, I think the one, one part of it is coming to some sort of consensus as quickly as possible is essential because every week that this goes by, in, in a sense, either compresses the schedule that we put forward to you or possibly delays. So I think, you know, depending on how much of a window we need to come to consensus, that's that's would be the impact on the on the schedule and ultimately your December 22nd vote. Um, so I think that's also why we're trying to um, get, come to some sort of closure this evening on, you know, down to two choices, one choice, I think. But if you don't have a choice tonight, there, and, and whatever the next date you select to get together, there will be, could be a minimal, minimal impact or a significant impact. It really depends on, on some of the decisions we make after that tonight in terms of uh, next steps that you would need to make in order, for, uh, uh, in order to make an informed decision. I think that Dr. Jell had mentioned a couple different items. I thought transportation or something was one of them. You know, all that takes time to build that and, and kind of put that together. Which, once again, we serve at the pleasure of the Board of Education, but I think it's important to know what the impact uh, is based upon your decisions or your recommendations this evening. So I'll take uh, one last uh, comment from uh, Commissioner Simmons, and then I think we'll go into determining um, 
you know, what, what, what is the consensus of the board or what is the majority uh, thinking of the board around school configuration? Commissioner Simmons. Thank you. Um, I think you touched on it a bit, Mike, as far as um, the resources, the use of resources may have played a role in some of the previous decisions. Because I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, I'm thinking of what Commissioner Powell just spoke about when we talk about Charlotte being a middle school at one point. Um, someone correct me if I'm wrong. I think Jefferson was a, a middle school, Freddie Thomas. And so we had these middle schools in the past that didn't uh, necessarily pan out well. And one of those pieces like you just touched on were the resources uh, maybe not being allocated as effectively as they could have been. Have we? What learnings do we have as we go back into the space and start considering again? What learnings are we pulling from from that history to ensure that we move forward more informed? That's that's a great question, Commissioner Simmons. Uh, I, I think if you look at our decision making around uh, that the board made around this phase two schools, we did not um, make decisions around changing grade level configuration. Um, you know, we went back to the. the we, we knew that we weren't trying to force fit a K-8 building into school 16 when you did not have enough space to do the appropriate um, science labs and everything else you would need. We did not, um, I think the other one was school four was a K-8 building at one point. We did not do an addition there. So that we were very disciplined in that phase about keeping the configurations uh, as they were or not adjusting, uh, not putting large additions on a building and adding more square footage to our, to our campuses when you know, when that when it really wasn't functional in order to do so, it would have been very cost prohibitive, it would have really affected local share. And that's so that was one really important lesson that we learned that and the board made their decisions based upon that. Um, I think the the other thing that we really learned is um, the second thing we learned is in terms of not once staying true to the decisions we make to the vote you make in December. Um, in phase one decisions were made after the vote was taken. And Jefferson was actually in phase one modernization and was removed. And we had added air conditioning to a, a several buildings, which once again, obviously no one's gonna argue not having air conditioning, but when you change the plan after you've adopted it, all your financial models changed. And that was one of the impacts. If we had stayed true to what the plan was, Jefferson would have been renovated now. So I think we're really, that's the second lesson that we learned in terms of, uh, in terms of phase two is not, is you know, what, what is decided is what we implement and it's not, you know, we've had several superintendents during phase two and they can't come in and change the entire program based on um, uh, some sort of an initiative that they have. It, we, that, so that part of it was a real, uh, a real key piece and it really saved, uh, saved resources. And I think the last piece is we were not gonna go beyond local share. And um, we, 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 we were able to secure some supplementary monies. The state was great in terms of working with us on some other options, but our local share stayed under $18 million. So, um, you know, there's, it wasn't perfect by any means, right? I'm not saying by any means it was. There were certainly some issues to, that we we've, we've, we've talked about, but those are really the three key areas that um, really guided us during, during phase two, especially at the initial decision-making point. And I think if you go back and look at the work we did at the eight elementary schools, um, School Without Walls, East, Monroe, and Edison, that's work that's going to be legacy work. None of that work is not going to, we're not going to regret investing those resources in those particular facilities because they're all K-6 K or K-5 buildings. They're going to be functional as K-6 or K-5 buildings for the next 100 years. So I think that's where, as you reflect back onto the board, we made, you as a board made very good decisions, different commissioners out at the time, very, very good decisions because you were disciplined in your thinking um, and you took all the information in and then, and then made, those, made, made, those, made those decisions in terms of that, where I think in the past, the emotion sometimes gets in, it gets in the way of common sense. And I think that's, that's one part where we really remove, try to remove the emotion as much as possible in that second round of deliberation. Once again, it wasn't perfect. I'm not saying that by any means, but those are three key lessons learned. Madam President. Carl, I see you have your hand up, um, but I want to get to a vote, so uh, um, it's a consensus, just a, if you will. But just a Go real ahead. question, is, uh, especially given what Commissioner Simmons and uh, Mr. Schmidt just said, is, you know, in addition to Freddie Thomas having been built as a middle school, um, Monroe had been a middle school for decades. The uh, building that we now you call the Wilson Foundation Academy was built as the Madison Middle School. So um, 
I would be very interested in seeing if we changed the uh, policy 4100, which of these high schools is going to be converted back to a middle school, which high schools will be, have middle schools co-located with them, and which elementary schools would be converted from elementary to middle school in order to accommodate this proposed new um, uh, new um, organization of instruction. But right. to your point, uh, uh, President Elliott, about uh, getting to a vote or a straw poll or whatever, it I just go back to if if Dr. Jallo is recommending that we get more data, we're, I don't think we're going to get more real data tonight. I don't think anybody came prepared to talk about the academic, um, uh, the, the supposed academic uh, benefits of, of a K-5 versus a pre-K-5 versus a pre-K-6. Um, I did hear plenty of support for a pre-K-6, a 7-8, and a 9-12. That particular configuration being best suited for the current New York State accountability standards that's how we're being held accountable in those increments. So that's I it. Think, Thank you. Commissioner, I, I, if the first part was a question, I would only thing I would caution is let we are going to let the data and the test fit responses, that's going to guide your decisions as a board around schools will elevate themselves into being candidates to be uh, to have for grade level configuration, either maintaining or possibly adjusting or they'll, or they'll drop out. And we'll look at seat availability as, as Vice President LeBron talked about seats in the Northwest zone. We'll, you know, if we're gonna keep seven, eight students in their zone and have a, 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 a continuum from K to eight, but within that, within that group, that's gonna affect some of the decision-making, but we get ahead of ourselves if we're trying to, we're gonna fit square pegs in the round hole, so to speak. So I think we'll, we're gonna come back with test fits for every school based on the configuration that you decide this evening. And that will then, things will shake out as they, as they will um, and that's where one of some of the difficult decisions that you're going to have to make, because ultimately, you know, everyone's going to have their own, uh, own, own viewpoint on some of these things. And, you know, I, I, we're just here to provide the information and the data and then, and then get any additional data that you would need in order to make decisions. That's what Erica and, and the team are committed to. Yeah, so it seems as if we're talking about K through 6, 7, 8, 9, 12 model. Is that what the will of this board is? We still, we, we also need to, in my view, formalize this, but before, in, as we go into our business meeting on next, on this coming Thursday, but the question that I have is around, you know, the policy as it is now. Um, Mike and, and Dr. Peluso, if we left this meeting um, with the board uh, having a consensus around that model that I just described, is that sufficient for you all to start moving out? Um, given that we do have to, uh, Commissioner Powell, um, change the policy, you know, and then how long does that process take? So that, that those are the questions that I have right now. I'm gonna go to uh, Vice President LeBron. Yeah, so I just wanna reiterate what Mike just said. I do agree that we're gonna need additional data points, but tonight's not that night. It's yeah. more like trying to figure out which direction we need to go. But I do want to point out, though, um, as we move forward, President Elliott, and you take the roll call after this piece, um, that we're going to need information for data points, as you call it, test fitting, Mike, for the different potential options that you're including, not just the seats by the zones, what transportation would cost or look like. Um, I know that there's some interest in having middle schools, having yellow buses and not RTS. I know I was like afraid for my own daughters because it is more, it's, it's just very challenging when you have kids traveling on, on, on RTS and they're like 12 and 13, it's very scary. Um, so I just want us to like, when we have those conversations that you're bringing those data points as well and what those cost association might look like at the next conversation. I don't wanna confuse the community that we're deciding right now what configuration looks like what we're deciding is that we're gonna uphold the policy 
or we're going to move forward in a different direction with reconfiguration and whether that's you know pre-k six pre-k five pre-k you know seven eight nine nine twelve nine through twelve none of that has been decided tonight and i don't think it can be decided tonight with limited information and almost virtually no data um, but I do think we do owe it to the administration to have a decision, again, whether we're upholding this policy or we're moving in a different direction so that they then know how to pull together and test fit some, some options for the board. And then perhaps President Elliott, our next work session, I know we scheduled some already on everyone's calendar for FMP, so maybe we need to figure out um, if the next one is enough time to get more data to make a concrete decision then before the actual vote. But we're not there yet. But I just want to, because I think I have people texting me in the community confused, thinking we're about to decide on reconfigurations right now with no data, and we are not. We are just deciding on whether we're going to uphold the policy or go in a different direction. That's all we're deciding right now. Thank you. All right. So, so the question becomes, are we um, satisfied with the current policy? Do we want to go through the, uh, are we interested in, in moving to the, the model that was uh, recommended or suggested, the K6, uh, 6, uh, 7, 8, 9, 12 model? We have to keep in mind that um, our time schedule, the time schedule that uh, Mike is uh, recommended to us, if we don't move like we should move on this, it's going to delay it. That costs us time and that costs us money. So we need to be leaving um, here tonight, given uh, Dr. Peluso and, and, and Chief Smith um, some direction and you know what, what are we gonna do? So um, I heard, I think I heard people, is there any objection to the uh, pre-K six, seven, eight, nine, 12 model? Any objection to that model? from my board colleagues. Okay, Ricardo, Commissioner Adams. Saying is different than what was just said. Um, Say that again. Saying, what you're saying is different than what was just said a minute ago. Um, it was said that we, my decision is I don't want to stay still with the old policy. That's my decision. Okay. But now you're putting other details with this and it's, I, I can't. I, I, you're putting me in the corner. Yeah, but the, thing, in the corner. Yeah. The the issue though is is that it's going to take more time. It is it's going to cost us money. It's going to delay the project. Now keep in mind, we also have a consideration that I I didn't bring this up, but the, the issue that I that may be is the supply chain. Are we going to be able to get the supplies that we need in order to do this? So all of that is um, what we have to take into you know, consideration. Uh, Commissioner Adams, what is it going to take for you to... Uh, so I'm just one vote, though. I'm just one vote. Yeah, uh, no, no, but I'm just saying... I, I'm, I'm not going to vote to keep it the same way. Okay. I'm just telling you that I'm concerned that we're... I, I'm just concerned that this is... This, this is not just the way to do business. That's all. I had to express that. I'm done. Okay. Okay. Commissioner Powell. Well, I, I've had ample time to uh, an opportunity to express my uh, vantage point. It is in agreement with what you stated, President Elliott, but I would also offer that the next policy committee meeting is August 2nd. You almost can't get sooner than that. Um, and if, if you would like for me to bring a, um, a draft to the board uh, to to debate, discuss, tear apart, uh, that would that would be the something different that Commissioner Adams has um, suggested and uh, but that would allow us to not like box ourselves in tonight. We can do that too, but I do I do have a defined position on this and I agree with the way you stated it, President Elliott. All right, uh, Kalia, you had your, you got your hand up. Can't hear you, Kalia. Well, something is going on. You may want need to put it in the chat. 
Um, I can actually just say that Kali is going to say that the next policy meeting was actually changed until August 23rd, and I think that was a decision of the policy chair. Well, so that, we did get an email that policy changed. I, that is before I canceled my vacation plans because of my health uh, emergency last week. So if we wanted to go back to the August 2nd, I can do that too. I, I'm I'm going to speak for myself, President Elliot. I'm sorry to like jump in. I just want to I want to keep it where it's at because I already changed my schedule based on the change. Um, but President Elliot, I just wanted to add to just what Ricardo um, was expressing that I don't think, as much as administration would want a a, fin a, a final decision today, then they we should have had more data. I'm not prepared to make a final decision on reconfigurations today. What I am prepared today to support is that we not uphold the policy and we have a deep dive conversation with data around reconfiguration and what that looks like, what that may potentially cause, pros, cons, um, what that, you know, seats would look like, zones and so forth. Um, I also think that that conversation is going to kick up the managed choice um, policy and conversation and that we're going to have to put that at the forefront in this FMP process as we move forward um, and that that policy be accelerated for additional um, input and conversations. But I am with with Commissioner Adams on this piece. Like I'm not prepared to give them a, a finet, a final decision, if you will, without the data to know. I, I mean, I have ideas, Right, but I don't know if those ideas are good or not based on, on data. And I would need to do my own research as well, like I said, and look at other school districts, other big fives, um, reach out to other school board members across the country around their reconfigurations who have similar um, populations um, that reflect our school district and size and budget. Um, I think all of those pieces, you know, is part of doing our due diligence just because I just I'm not, I'm not personally prepared to say yes. This is the model. Although I strongly would support um, a, a middle school of seven eighth. Uh, again, I, I'm not prepared if I had to vote on that tonight. That that's the vote for me. So how many? Let me just ask this question: How many do we have who will support the K the model that we just described this evening? How, how many are willing to do that this evening? Okay. Well, Amy? I, not this even like the final decision. I, I think that that's something we need to put on the table and consider. I would like us to change the policy, though. I want us to get away from our current model. All right. Um, Commissioner Adams, I think you had your hand up. Can't, can't hear you. I had my hand up for uh, it was really something different. I, I, um, would ask my fellow commissioners that we probably would need to consider something earlier than August 23rd. Um, I think that is a little, a, a, that's a bit much. Um, but other than that, um, y'all know where I stand. Here, here. Okay. President Elliott. I, yes. If the just the uh, I think some context purpose. I think the I, by having a decision earlier in August, that allows us to continue our progress. Right. So we we made the initial submission based upon the uh, distinguished or the our monitors recommendations that the board had voted on. That's in your packet now, so you will see school 19 as a pre-K five and so on and so forth. Um, we don't, the reason why we called this tonight is we do not want to go any further without everybody being all in, right? So we, I, I don't, just to be for context purposes, we were not, we're not demanding that, you know, the board makes a decision or else kind of a thing, but it is important to outline the context that the sooner we get together in August, that the, the more we can stay on schedule for that December 22nd uh, meeting time. And, uh, I think it also depends on what information that you actually need in order to make this decision, because whatever is tasked, we're going to have to, to lay that out within the resources that we have available to us. And if it's something for August the 2nd, per se, then some of that may not be able to be put together because it may not be in exist existence yet. So I, I know we, we do not have a district-wide building 
continuum around pre-K 6, 7, 8, 9, 12. Um, something that we would be willing to share publicly without, you know, without more, more, more work internally. So that doesn't exist right now. So if that was something that was needed in order to make the decision, then we're going to need a little more time to do that. And then to put that together, if that's really what you need to make this decision. I, and I, I'm not, like I said, I'm not willing to shy away from the work at all, but I do think if we're going to decide on a date as early in August as you possibly can do it, but that date needs to be counted by what the actual information that you that you need in order to make that decision. Um, I hope I make that myself clear. So if I have to wait to the 23rd of August because there's the, the material we have to put together is is it's going to take that long to do, then we have to wait to the 23rd of August. What we don't want to do is spend a dime of money on test fits and configuration stuff until we're all in on a decision because that would be obviously that would be a, uh, a not an effective use of uh, of resources. So. Um, I think that's, uh, and you know, and then the implications are what they are, right? That's not, we, we knew going into this conversation that there was a risk that you would not, you would stay not, you would change your board policy. So we, you know, we, we built that into the, into our conversation. And um, I think that's uh, uh, into our planning, excuse me. But I, in order to fully articulate it, your date of when you're gonna get together, um, you, have an, you have a plan modernization meeting for, the, for August 29th, a work session on the calendar, what date and then what information that you, the board needs in order for in order to make that ultimate decision about which where you want to go with grade level configuration moving forward. Mr. LeBron. Yeah, I just want to on my calendar and outlook, I have a work session for August 4th and I don't know if there's any topics on there, but um, you know, I, I just want to say this to the administration because I know, like, and I'm going to say this with love. Yeah, I want us to make decisions. I got to come with concrete data if you want a decision then and now. That's the only way I'm going to make a decision if they're presenting data. If you're presenting some general ideas, conversation, then yeah, the next step is going to be, um, you know, a, a conversations with data. But um, I don't know, Kylie, if you can confirm whether it's August 4th or August 11th, I think Commissioner Adams is telling me August 11th, but I only have August 4th on my calendar. We can't hear you, Kylie, so either do four and one one. <laughs> August 4th, so we have a work session on August 4th. So if the administration can pull together data, and I can speak for myself in terms of what data I would like to see. I would like to understand the actual number of students that we have in each of these grades, because that's going to be important. We can't say we want middle schools and then they're under enrolled or over enrolled, if you will. Um, so I would like to understand the, the number of seats for each grade that we currently have, what a configuration of seats would potentially look like for those grades, what the potential cost would be in keeping the model the same versus changing it. Would there be any actual savings realized? What the cost of transportation might be? Will the, the cost go up? go down. Um, I've already mentioned the Northwest as an entire quadrant that doesn't have seventh or a, a, an eighth grade right now, um, which means that every single student that passes sixth grade in that quadrant has to be shipped out to, um, to the South Zone or the Northwest. So I do think there's implications around that. Um, also, Commissioner Malloy mentioned the if there was a sixth, seventh, eighth what the teaching certification requirement would be and how that would be different if it was just middle school. Um, so all of those pieces, um, I think are gonna be important. And Mike and Carmine, um, I'd be more than happy to have some additional conversations offline, just in terms of data points that I think would be important uh, to present because I may not be remembering them all now, but there are just data points that I would wanna understand um, and staffing, right? What that would look like versus staffing, fully staffing an elementary school versus a middle school based on the number of students, what counselors would look like at middle school versus high schools, um, sports. I know Commissioner Adams mentioned sports and any potential implications around that. Those I think would be all critical pieces. And I know Dr. Jallo mentioned data around the academic piece. Um, and implications around that, bring that out too. I think all of that needs to be on the table in order for us to make a solid informed decision. Thank you. Commissioner Powell. So some of the things that Vice President O'Brien just stated 
um, in terms of the, the, the cost, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, Mr. Schmidt, but it would test fitting would tell us a whole lot more about the potential costs than a conversation purely around the policy decision because uh, we can make the policy decision well, we have to make a policy decision before uh, Mr. Schmidt can um, work up the various scenarios that in turn have financial implications, right? Uh, so um, I'm not sure how much, how accurate the numbers could possibly be uh, in terms of the dollars and cents. Uh, I think that the information I would need to see would be the kinds of information that Dr. Jallo is suggesting we need uh, to make grade level configuration decisions. Um, that's all, thanks. The only thing I would, I, Vice President LeBron is the, I would hesitate around having a public conversation around a particular school or building. We, we, we have been through that before where we have schools become very anxious when they're, when they're discussed publicly without us sharing and being able to talk to constituents and administrate principals and, and teachers and, and families um, in, in terms of that. So by putting together a, a citywide continuum around these uh, uh, this proposed configuration, we'll, we're, we're going to end up identifying schools that or buildings that may have to change in this in this conversation. And I, I don't, I'm not actually comfortable doing that just based upon um, without doing the appropriate test fits to see if everything works. So I, I do think I probably can find some middle ground here because I'm not. I certainly know we have some information we can provide, but I don't know if that's. Um, if that's something that we really want to try to pull together and do it somewhat haphazardly in the sense of not having all the information and then we're discussing schools and buildings publicly that really we're not ready to have those conversations and that's really counter to what we did in the fall where we had schools that heard about heard about things uh secondhand and that ended up being much more of a challenge for uh for schools going forward so i, I would hesitate in terms of going that far into it but i do think if there is some um, uh, some of the items I, I've jotted down, some of the items just mentioned, but I think some of those things we certainly could pull together. Um, the other thing is any sort of a cost impact would also be probably premature because we don't know what it's going to take to um, to either convert a billing to a 7-8 if we're not going to, or or whatever that might be. So I think anything we would share publicly around costs or, or building aid units or reimbursement also would be probably premature and it would probably maybe even share inaccurate information, which is what we don't want to do. So I think um, if we can, we can certainly talk, you know, in terms of getting some, some things that we could pull together. And then that August 4th that date may be a challenge depending on what is specifically asked for, right? I, you know, um, I, I don't want to commit to something until I really know what it is. So um, we have, I know we have one scheduled the 29th of August. And, um, but I, anything else prior to that, depending on what the ask is, could be a bit of a challenge. And like I said, we really yeah. tonight, so I think that's where we are tonight. After our conversations last week, you know, either we're keeping the policy or we're going to relook at the policy, and then you determine as a board how long you want to take to look at the policy. I mean, that's that's your your decision in all this. We're not trying to presuppose a decision. We're not trying to come and ask for a decision without bringing all the information. In fact, it's counter to that. We want to find out where you're headed as a board, and then provide be able to provide you the information to make an informed decision. So I think that's, if you were gonna to stick to your policy tonight, then we would just move forward with it. If that, if that, but that's obviously not the decision. So we're prepared to do something in that regard, but um, I just wanna make sure that, you know, we're, we are on the same page in regards to what expectations going forward. So if, it, if, you, if the decision is to look at the pre-K six, seven, eight, nine, 12, from a variety of perspectives by a date in August and bring back that information to the board and share that publicly, then that's certainly something we can do. Um, and, I, and then we can kind of maybe figure out what would we want, what we want to discuss publicly or not because that, based on, on that conversation. But I do think um, date certain by August 29th, we certainly can do that. That's a long way out and that's a lot of time, but you have to make a decision based upon what's, what's best for this community. And I don't want to put a time clock on that decision. That's not necessarily fair to you. 
um, nor put pressure on that, you as a group, not you as an individual, Vice President LeBron, but you as a group. So um, I think the deliberation around the date and Kelly can share with us what the board is really considering in terms of, uh, of information, and then we can, we can move forward based upon that, if that's acceptable to, to you as a board. I just want to follow up President Elliott. So let me just be clear. One, I'm not a board member from the past. So I just want to be clear that what was acceptable to previous board members as a minimum standard is not my minimum standard. And if you're telling me that the administration can't come to this board with an overview general budget, I don't need an exact number because I doubt that our exact numbers in our budget now are even accurate. So I just want to be clear about this. There should be a process that says, here's an overall cost analysis of what it's costing us now to run under this configuration and what it may potentially cost us later. Um, that could be done in very general terms with an understanding that it's an estimation. The other piece is that you can also estimate where we currently have schools, what their configurations are and what the configuration may look by zone without naming schools. I do not want any school to feel anxious. You know, in fact, I went to the administration for months and said, do not make this proposal public. It will not pass. And the administration ignored me and moved forward. And I'm not saying that was you, Mike, or Carmine, so I just want to be clear. But I just want to be clear, like, when it makes sense, it makes sense. And if it doesn't make sense, it's repetitive to have these conversations. But we should be able to have a minimum standard of conversation, very general, high level, of how many schools exist in our current zones, what grades they are, and what grade configurations would look like without naming any school based on the number of actual students that are enrolled in our school by grade, what configuration would be needed to meet the needs of our current enrollment. So I just wanna be clear about that because I, I don't want to make it seem like you all have to go back and give us a school by school breakdown of which school, every school that's gonna get configured, what that looks like, what the, I'm not asking for that, but I do wanna have a baseline understanding of where we're at and what change would look like potentially in general. Um, and again, I'm more than happy to have a sit down with you both to have some conversations around doing even an estimation with the finance team to talk about um, coming back to the board and to this community with some general numbers, if you will, that are estimations based on where we're currently at, configuration and cost as we move staff and teachers around. Thank you. So I just can um, absolutely could work with you to kind of get that done. Is there any other additional information? And I'm jotting down some here from um, around budget for pre-K five, pre-K six, seven, eight, six, eight, nine, twelve. just on both those configurations, school numbers, enrollment numbers, we could get all that. Is there anything else um, from any other board members that we would need um, or they would like to see? You captured the staffing capacity, right? That that piece. And I know um, Vice President LeBron spoke about school social workers and, and counselors and things of that nature. I know that there's been an uptick in student need um, is around the social, emotional and, and mental health pieces. So I don't know how that programming is allocated, but um, just the school resources are what I want to know more about uh, resource allocation, if that makes sense. So let me just, let me just, let me just um, go back and get an understanding. So um, I, we'd asked a question about the school configuration, you know, was there support for the K6, 7, 8, 9, 12 model? And I think that there were at least three hands um, that I'm in favor of that. I thought, I thought I saw Commissioner Powell, um, and I'm not sure who else was in favor of that. Or do you want to just wait and have that conversation until you get the data? Is that where we are as a board at this yeah, point? Yeah, it sounds like that's where we are as a board. Um, I don't want to speak out of out of turn. I know that I favor the the piece, the K through six, seven, eight, nine through twelve. That's something that I'm leaning towards. But yes, I think we do need to get the data. I know, Doctor, uh, Doctor. Okay, Doctor LeBron. That's what we're going to go. Vice President LeBron um, spoke about that. I know uh, Commissioner Adams raised that. I think those are very strong points. So yeah, we do need to do our due diligence around this. So I am weighing towards that. If we're looking to get a idea of where people are leaning, 
that's the the role that I'm leaning towards the uh, configuration that I just spoke of the uh, there's two of them but that's the main one that I'm leaning towards other than that yeah we need to get more information and so we can make a, a concrete decision so at our next meeting once we get the data are we prepared to make a decision whenever that meeting is going to be are we prepared at the next meeting or whenever once we get the data are we prepared to make a decision at that point is it a fair question, President, to just ask this? Because um, there were two configurations that I was considering. It looks like most of the board was considering those same two configurations, because then that at least narrows down the scope and allows that other that next uh, conversation to be very concise. What was the uh, other configuration that? What was the alternative? And so this is my question. So the one, the two that I was looking at, pre-K through five, six through eight, and nine through twelve. Okay. The other one was K through six, seven through eight, nine through 12. And that's where I thought we had narrowed things down to for further discussion. So let me just ask this question. Do we have the, uh, are people interested in the K, the pre-K through five models, six through eight and nine, 12? How many are interested in that model? Okay. So it really is, okay. So it really is down to just the one. Okay. All right. Okay. When is the next meeting? When are we gonna schedule? Talia is typing in the chat, President Elliot, because yes, she's, she's having audio issues. Um, she apologizes. I'm just gonna read within the chat. She hasn't changed her audio settings since the beginning of the meeting and it's causing her microphone to malfunction. So she's communicating in the chat. The chat is shut off for board members. Only staff can use the chat. Um, so we can't respond to her and say if policy is rescheduled back to A2, that that would be the next available date. The board's work session that is already scheduled for August 4th, the topic is the board goals. So essentially there would be no room for that because board goals would take up our time. And I just want to say, I actually schedule a different board meeting for me on the second with another board I serve on because the date was changed and I had to give them a date. So to change all of the, my other colleagues' dates to go back and forth based on a date change here, I would not be available on the second. I just want to put that on record and why. Thank you, President Elliott. So she also mentioned August 9th. There's a special meeting August 9th that we can, um, we can meet during that time. So August 9th, are we prepared at that point, given if we get the data, is it, if we get uh, Dr. Peluso, uh, is can we get the data um, timely so that it can be reviewed and we are able to make a decision on August 9th? I will get you as much as this information as I can. I, I do want, I just want to reiterate what I heard. So on that meeting, just so that we're all clear, we're bringing forth pre-K 6, 7, 8, 9, 12 information. Yes? Correct. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Any more conversation? Any more conversation for this work session? Thank you. This this work session has been, you know, it really thought out and a lot of questions and a lot of uh, perspectives. A good conversation. Really appreciate it. Um, Adrian, I see you came on camera. Is there something else I need to say before we ask for a motion to adjourn? Uh, Oh, I thought you were going into a motion for executive session. So I think what, what I thought I understood is that we've got to end this meeting, then we go in. So I do make, need to make that motion. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, before I do that, though, let me go to um, Commissioner Patterson. Yes, one more thing I wanted to throw out, uh, even though I'm willing to vote, uh, however everyone else is uh, going to vote. Um, I think Rush Henrietta just switched to a 789 if I'm Correct. Did we want to look at theirs and see how that's working or even make a phone call there to see how that's working or we don't even want to entertain that? No, I think that the consensus, the, the vote is for the 7 8 model, 9 12, PK, P, pre K through 6, I think is where the votes are. I mean, you could, if you want to do that, you could reach out to find out how that is, uh, how that is working. Thank you. You know, um, uh, the, um, what Dr. Jallo's point had to do um, with regard to um, credits and um, you know that kind of thing. So 
Um, you may even want to reach out to Dr. Jallo to find out more about, you know, what the data shows around that. But yeah, you could check to see how it's working out if that's what you want to do. Yeah, I'll, I'll do both. Thanks. All right. Okay. All right. All right. So um, thank you, everybody. And uh, we're going to go into executive session. Uh, can I get a motion, please? I'll move. Uh, is there a second? Second. All those in favor? For the, right. for the purposes of um, discussing oh, yep. matters leading to the employment employment of a person and to receive advice of counsel. Yeah, what he said. <laughs> yeah. Second. All right. <laughs> thank, thank all you. right. Uh, we're going oh, into executive thanks. session. Oh, Kalia? Kalia can't talk, so she's going to probably try to put in the chat. Second was myself, uh, Vice President 